today we're going to talk about healthcare and we're going to talk about what's happened lately in healthcare and how disturbing it is. This is me. I've been working in this field for about 30 years, started with the Defense Department, the FBI, and then moved out to other things, especially developing these kind of programs with some admirals and generals after 9-11. And also for dams, we did a program for 77,000 dams, natural dams and man-made dams. And who ever would think that there were that many that didn't have a security program. So any terrorist could just walk into the dam the dam headquarters and just put a bomb in there and it would go off and, and you know, flood, uh, you know, 200,000 people downstream. So one of the worries that people in every industry worry about, I think schools, of course, uh, hospitals, healthcare, uh, power companies where they have the little counter where you can pay your electric bill. That's another, you know, point of tension. So all the, and of course, people who are at call centers, people who are doing a lot of phone work in these concentrated areas and they have issues and it all comes back to active shooter. It's the number one issue that keeps management up at night. So when you were going to talk about threats too, so what is your threat profile? Do you even know? We're going to give you some samples. You may not have heard, that, but it includes everything from domestic terrorism, these wrongful death lawsuits that are happening. In fact, after the Uvalde shooting in Texas, one of the things that happened is within uh, five days, a group of lawyers got together in Uvalde, Texas, and they get, they pre went to the school board meeting and presented a, a class action lawsuit to the school board that they had to sign for right on the spot. But that's how prevalent it is. But it's also extreme heat in Washington state where people and senior citizens, especially dying in their apartments because nobody even, they live alone, nobody even knows they're there. And it's 102 in their depart in their apartment because the, the central air went out because of the power, power grid load. The hurricanes and... Uh, I'll be the first to tell you it looks like we're going to have one next week, and I'll be sending out an alert about that after this webinar. Terror, and it's going to go right to the Gulf Coast, so we're not sure how much different places are going to be affected, but basically going from South Florida over to Louisiana, the same as it happened last year. And so you're going to want to see that uh, floods, homicide, shootings, tornadoes, thefts, assault, all these things. And I, I wonder if you know even what your threat profile is for all of these, but just take a look at this. Let's look at Parkland, Florida. This is a uniform crime index that the FBI keeps, and it's done by zip code, or if the zip code's too, too big, then they cut it up and put in uh, regions in there too. So I'll we'll start with Parkland, Florida. This is where I live. I was right here the day the attacks happened. I saw the whole thing. The, the three-story building where all the kids were killed is still there. They haven't gotten the money to knock it down yet. So every day, and they sealed it. So they took the bodies out, the 34 bodies, 17 killed and all children, 17 wounded, took them out. Everything else is still there. Blood on the floor. Somebody, a local police officer gave me a tour of it. Everything else is still there exactly like it was that day four years ago in uh, Valentine's Day, February 14th, 2018. And But now look, it's pretty good on a scale of one to 100, it's 77. That means it's safer than 23, only 23% 23 of the U.S. is safer than Parkland. So let's look at Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. is a five, five out of 100. That means 95% of the U.S. is safer than Washington, D.C. Boston is a 19, and that means that 81%, these are, I'm sorry, these got transposed. 81% of the U.S. is safer than Boston. How about Beverly, famous Beverly Hills, 90210? Beverly Hills, California is a seven. 93% of the United States is safer than Beverly Hills. How about the middle of the country, Boise, Idaho, 30%. So it's got a 30. So that means 70% of the U.S. is safer than Boise, Idaho. So these are just one of the many numbers that we put together to see what you should be doing. And we also are have been since June, seventh with this domestic terrorism bulletin out. I would just copy the screen, open it up, look at it, and send it to everybody in my organization because I think it's so critically important that tells you what to be alert for, what to watch out for. It's only like a page and a half. These are just some examples of where things are going. So this is, uh, I thought this was applied to everybody because everybody has a has TV. So this is a Texas judge who ordered Spectrum Cable and Charter Communications to pay more than $7 billion in damages to a family uh, where an 83-year-old grandmother was stabbed and killed in her home by the cable guy. And so it started out when he went over there for a routine cable visit. He was a Spectrum Cable installer, but uh, Charter Communications is their parent company. And he saw this lady, she had money laying around, she had jewelry, she had credit cards and a thing on her coffee table. So he came back the next day and 
in his uniform, even though he'd already done the work, he came back and knocked on the door and said, oh, well, we need it, it, just one little cable. So she let him in and he stabbed her to death, took all her credit cards and had it went on a shopping spree, spent like $5,000, then was picked up immediately after that. And a jury found that Charter Communications, a parent company, was grossly negligent in his death, in the death, not because of the stabbing, but because he lied about his work history, but turned out Spectrum never verified employees' work history. They just, whatever you wrote down on the thing, that was it as far as they were concerned, and missed other red flags, like his felony, like the fact they'd been arrested. They were all ignored by the supervisors. They never even saw him. And to make matters worse, Spectrum charged the family $58 for the service call where they killed his grandmother, and then uh, sent the unpaid bills to a collection agency. I guess she's dead, so it doesn't ruin her credit. They Originally, the jury awarded the family $375 million in compensatory damages, and it was a joint ju judgment against Spectrum and Charter. And right, But right after that, they said that Charter had to pay 90% of the costs, and a judge announced Charter has to pay an additional $7 billion to the family. So this one 83-year-old lady's life, I guess, was worth $7 billion. And they said the jury in this case was thoughtful and attentive to the evidence. The verdict justly reflects extensive evidence regarding the harm of caused by Spectrum, Charter Spectrum's gross negligence and reckless misconduct. For the safety of the American public, we only hope that Charter Spectrum and its shareholders are listening. And so they did it to send a message. But again, they got $7 billion in payment for that. This is one of the recent, this is July 13th. I thought this was interesting. This is in in uh, Missouri, St. Louis, Missouri. This is a nurse and a paramedic stabbed and left with serious injuries. SSM Health DePaul Hospital. And the nurses said that the, they had gone many, that it was so unsafe in their hospital that they'd gone many times in to talk the management about increasing security at the hospital including uh, uh, recommending more staff, adding concealed weapon metal detectors to prevent these workplace violence incidents. And so nothing happened, of course, until this 30-year-old came into the ER, took a knife out of her uh, purse and started trying to stab staff members. One witness said that I heard somebody say she has a knife. I looked up and I saw the woman stabbing everybody she could reach and everybody just run in and, and jumped on her as soon as they could. They said the staff had asked for years to uh, ask for more security guards and metal detectors. And the nurses said they were not surprised. They said it's 100% preventable. When you're working at DePaul, you're literally walking down the hall looking over your shoulder. And in fact, one of the people from DePaul had already left and joined another one of my hospital in upstate New York. That's a client of mine. And the guy, and I called up to ask and he said, yeah, we, we hired this guy from uh, DePaul because they had no security. So that it's ex actually affecting staffing levels at this point. But prosecutors said the knife was, was recovered. She was Her bail was set at $2 million, which I'm sure she couldn't pay. And it's ironic that the staff members who had requested more security on site, more metal detectors were the ones who were attacked. Obviously, the hospital was aware of the danger, and all of a sudden, it was too late. So that's why I do these webinars. Don't charge anything for them. I just want you to be aware, because I don't want that to be you. It's so much easier to fix this stuff before something horrible happens. And so, sure enough, one week after the stabbing, hospital increased security right away one week after in the statement they said they'd been working on it for months it was part of their extensive system-wide evaluation of their physical environment and they had already hired somebody to staff the emergency room 24 hours a day that added a metal detector to that department and it was a six hospital in st louis which again is it has a really high threat level add a metal detector into the emergency department but sometimes you know that's what it took in this case briefly go through the active shooter incidents in the united states in 2021 2020 to 2021 we had 40 incidents active shooter incidents in 19 states one year later we had 61 in 30 states so it was a huge increase how many casualties did we have in 2020 we had 164 casualties 38 killed and 126 wounded in 2003 one year later they had 243 casualties 103 killed which is three times it's 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 about it's a hundred percent increase in casualties but it's also a uh, th uh, th three time increase in the number of people killed went from 103 from 38 to 103 and wounded 126 and 140 so more people were killed than were before and only luckily one only one law enforcement officer was killed 11 were wounded in 2021 it was two killed and five wounded at five of these incidents some of which we that we've talked about already on other webinars a mass killing definition where four more were killed and in 2021 12 met that definition so you can 
look at this when I send you the slides. Here's some of the things that are going on. One thing is coming out of a recession, the revenue problems prevented hospitals from putting in the controls because when there's a recession, the states lose a lot of their discretionary money and they lose a lot of money that's used to help hospitals and fund hospitals, county, I mean, county hospitals and things like that. They lost that. Also, there is still this, it can happen here mentality that I heard 10 years ago. And now somebody even told me that six months ago. And then Uvalde, the thing that I thought was when they came out and said there's such a close-knit community and never thought anything could happen here. They're right. And everybody else thinks that too. Everybody in their own organization thinks this is such a great organization. Nothing like that can ever happen here. And as soon as you start to think that, you're going down the, the road to disaster. Also, older administrators, they still think of the hospitals. They don't put down on the floor very often in the lobby. They're up in their beautiful office and they think of hospitals as places of refuge, that people are always on their best behavior. And in truth, nobody's on their best behavior. And they're also not aware of these huge fines, these wrongful death lawsuits. We used to mention them in passing because there would maybe one or two a year. And now every incident's got five or six lawyers getting together and in a group and doing a class action lawsuit against anything that gets county or city funding or federal funding or certainly hospitals, all 17 types of healthcare providers come into that. And it's deep pockets. They know that. And a lot of these things are required, not a choice anymore. So we've seen people be banned from uh, getting federal funds from CMS anymore, the uh, Centers for Medicare to Medicare, they, they basically reimburse most of the procedures that go on in hospitals. And they don't understand what, because of the uh, 2016 emergency rule on, on uh, emergency, final rule on emergency preparedness, that these things are now required. You have to do drills every year, two drills a year. One could be a tabletop. You have to have training. You know, you have to do all these other things too, but they don't realize that. When you sit down and talk to them, as I've done, have to do, they're amazed. They they did not know that all these things were happening. And that's why to go in and ask somebody for new security solutions is not a bad thing. It's something that, that you should be do, do and do it proudly and explain to them what's going on now. I mean, workplace violence is not slowing down. I get five articles a day in my email about workplace violence increasing. Even though it's a known problem, it, 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 it happens more today than it did in uh, 2021 and 2020 and all these different places. Hi, Mark. Yes, we can do that. Uh, would you write me this note again later? Because I can't capture all this here in my thing, but I will. Uh, I will look at it later. Thank Thank you very much. So how common is it for somebody to get hurt in healthcare? It's common as it's more dangerous, OSHA says, than working on a high rise building or on a telephone pole, you know, with a wire attaching you to the to the safety bar. And seven out of 10 physicians now say violence in the emergency departments is increasing. In fact, I saw something yesterday that said it's actually 98% of doctors feel like that it's damaging to patient health now. This is one of the big settlements they have. So it's not just physical security facilities facility security. That's what we're going to talk about today. But also they had the record year for settlements from law enforcement. Uh, the Office of Civil Rights settled 10 cases and secured a judgment for $28 million for HIPAA violation, 22% higher than the previous record of 23.5 due to the largest HIPAA settlement in history of $16 million with Anthem. That was for a, a breach in, in 2015 that went to court and affected 80 million healthcare consumers. So why is this still happening? We see it every day. People talk about it. I do webinars. We Everybody commiserates about it at conferences and talks about it. And it's still happening and it's getting worse. How can that be? If, if all the vendors are out selling all their products and people are buying security products, how can it still be such an afterthought to people? And the, the, the main reason I think is because if you think about it, like an auditor, security controls are still an expense item on a balance sheet and that's not what they want. So they tend to take those out, especially at the end of the year, make their balance sheet look better. And that's why it's so hard to get the money for these. It also still follows this law enforcement model. People say, I'm, oh, I'm, you know, saying something against the police. I'm not, I love the police. And, you know, I'm having lunch with policemen on Monday and on Tuesday next week. So, you know, the law enforcement model says you find somebody does something bad. So say that they steal something or they kill somebody, you've got to find out who did it, right? That's the whole deal. You go investigate, you find out who got it and you bring them in and you turn them over to the justice system. That's what happens in local government. That's what happens as you can play out every day on a federal level. And also because of this law enforcement model, the security is completely different. In the security model, you have to work with people. You have to meet all these compliance requirements that police 
police departments really don't have anything near the compliance requirements that healthcare does. And you also have to make it uh, palatable to people. You have to make sure that people around aren't caught in bad situations. They're not aware, I think, a lot of people of how much technology, artificial intelligence is embedded in these products. It, so there's this artificial separation between physical security and technology. One of the things that really bothers me is that Security Magazine is about IT stuff. It should be about what I'm talking about today, physical security and facility security, which are really the same thing. So we had a horrible summer of of incidents that we're going to cover in greater detail next week on the other web, new webinars coming out. But I just wanted to hit some of the ones. This was a period from May 15th to August uh, 30th. On May 15th, we started out with this uh, Geneva Presbyterian Church in Southern California. They had no access control. They had no weapon screening. A Chinese man who hated Taiwanese people drove two hours to get to this church. He brought Gorilla glue and he glued the church door shut. Then he got his, he brought his nail gun that was loaded with nails and he nailed the door shut. Then he chained them shut with a big chain and a deadbolt lock. Then he went back inside the church and he shot 10 senior citizens. I mean, these people, how could you shoot somebody age 75 to 90 who doesn't have any kind of weapon with them? There was one doctor there who his mother had asked, would he drive her because she couldn't see at night to drive very well? So he took his mother to church and he saw the shooter and he hit him with a chain and the shooter was stopped. Everybody uh, called the police and then they sat on the shooter till the police came. But he, the doctor was killed by the shooter, unfortunately. And the only reason for the attack was because the church members were Taiwanese. It was a small church, only 43 people there that night. Less than 10 days later, we have May 24th, we have the Uvalde school shooting, which I'm sure you've read all about. And then we have right after that on June 2nd, 10 days later, we have the Tulsa shooting, which we'll talk about. Turned out they had five people killed, the people who were wounded at the time. They also died. And this was a guy, Michael Lewis, who had a back problem. He was operated on by Dr. Preston Phillips, and he was able to walk into the, the, the medical building, which was on the St. Francis campus in Tulsa, Oklahoma, of the big St. Francis Hospital. And he went, just walked right upstairs. The receptionist said something to him. He shot and killed her. And uh, as a bystander there, he shot him. Then he went upstairs and he shot Dr. Phillips. Preston Phillips, a surgeon who had operated on him less than a month, month ago. He'd actually, and when he was released from the hospital, this Michael Lewis, the day he was released from the hospital, he went to a gun shop and bought an assault rifle. He already had a handgun that he'd bought from an area pawn shop. So he was all set. He just walked upstairs. He killed the two doctors, the doctor who operated on him and another doctor who was there. And then he, the other people both died too. So that's how easy it is to kill a doctor that you think. And a lot of this, some of these things are related to opioids and things like that. So this is, again, five Five, 10 days, six days later, June 3rd, go, we'll take you to uh, Southern California again, the, the San Fernando Valley and Sino Hospital Medical Center, where a guy left his car in the middle of the street. He had his dog on a leash. He left his car in the middle of the street, ran in here to the emergency department, got into the emergency department, killed a doctor, uh, stabbed a doctor and uh, stabbed two nurses and barricaded himself for four hours while the SWAT team tried to talk him down. They went through and broke the door down and they arrested him. And he, he had his dog with him like how crazy he is at the victims were taken to dignity health the trauma center in the in critical all in critical condition and some of them have all they've all had surgery now and an ultrasound technician was there and he told the radio uh the the guys who were filming it that he saw the man run in there and looked high on drugs he hit, looked anxious and he was drenched in sweat he went in there and he asked for anti-anxiety medicine and but and he didn't get it right away so he stabbed these people you look and say okay what could have prevented this of all the money you've spent on security in the last uh, five years. Could panic alarms have prevented this? Probably not. Having a live receptionist? Obviously not, because he killed the receptionist. Having a security officer present? Possibly, but there wasn't one at that time, or even in that building. Nobody assigned to the building. Everybody's on a big campus like that. They're doing these roving, you know, patrols, but not in that building. Uh, policies and procedures? That's not going to help you when you have an active shooter. Faster police response? No, because the police got there instantly. They actually had a, a small installation on the on the campus was because it was so large. How about concealed weapon screening to enter the building? And so that's what we're talking about. Weapons, actually calling it weapon screening detection. It catches all the, not just the concealed weapons, but all the weapons that you could have in your briefcase or anywhere else. Only, and I've gone over this and over this, it's the only control that you should spend your money on, I think until this crisis is over, crisis of shooting. 
This is another record breaker. This is the oldest active shooter who ever killed anybody, 71 years old, went to the Episcopal Church potluck dinner, the baby boomers potluck dinner, killing two and injuring one. And of course, the person that they injured died. So now they had three that he killed. And why did he kill the people? He sat down and had dinner with them. Then he got up from dinner and started shooting. And he had turned out that nobody knew him. He'd never been to the church before, but he was there anyway. He had recently lost his business, which was ironically a gun shop. And so he just uh, decided to go down there to the, saw the sign saying potluck dinner. And he went in with his gun and he shot three people. So these are issues that we talk about all the time are really about security and safety, not just about compliance and liability. They affect these things, the compliance you have to do and the liability that you have if one of these things occurs. But if you talk about liability reduction and you talk about client compliance with federal requirements, you're going to get a lot bigger budget than if you go in and talk about safety and security, which they think means that when you wash the floor, you should put down something that says, you know, careful water on the floor or something and security. They think about, again, locking somebody up. So the CMS, Centers for Medicaid and Medicare, final rule on emergency preparedness changed all this and they made it so much stricter. Also, the OSHA general duty clause requires every employer, even if you only have one employee, to maintain a safe environment free from, can add the word in here, recognized threats, because that's how the uh, duty clause reads. And now we're going to finally have a federal standard. on workplace violence. It's going to follow the guidelines in this publication, OSHA 3148. When I send you a note after the webinar, I'm also going to send you a copy of this so you can read it yourself, but it has a lot of really good information in it on how to, to stop workplace violence and prevent it. House Bill uh, 1195 that passed on April 21st, a year ago, 2021, it says it's going to, the new rule, the new law is going to refer to this document in particular. So getting started on it's a good thing. And I told you the House bill was passed a long time ago. Now this summer, the House bill passed, the Senate passed it, has 26 co-sponsors in the Senate. And so they're going to reconcile these two bills and we're finally going to have a, a real federal health care law. So how do you prevent these things from happening? The solutions for active shooters and workplace violence in healthcare is number one, A is for access control. So every Every door should be locked and it should be opened only with a card key. Even the lobby doors, I recommend having them uh, having a buzzer system so somebody can buzz and come in, but you have to know who's coming in your facility. The second is having enforced entry screening weapons detection system. Affiliated myself with this company, Athena Security, because I saw what they were doing and I saw how it how many lives it was saving. In fact, it's funny that the screening is not at all like the airport screening. And those of you who know me, a lot of you are on the call. You know, I'm in the, out the airport all the time. And what do I see at the airport? A long line. They have to x-ray the contents of the thing that has my shoes, my sweater, my jacket, has my laptop in one. And then the other one has my little carry-on bag in it. This is not like that at all. We're going to talk about how easy this is and how inexpensive it is and how it actually saves lives. The most current policies and procedures. I'm adding this in here because of Uvalde and other places where the policy, it was it, for 10 years has been that if there's a shooting, police go in and they disarm the shooter. That's the number one thing. They don't check the pulse of the other people who may be dead and laying in blood in the hall. They don't try to drag people out of there. They go after the shooter. So it stops it. And nobody seems to do that anymore. The last three incidents we've had in schools, they did not go after the shooter. That one in Parkland, which was right here, school resource officer, hid under the stairwell. And the next morning after this happened and all these uh, the kids were shot and injured, 
34 of them. He went in and got his retirement. He retired and said, uh, give me my retirement money now. And of course, that went through a big old, a big old mess. Uh, the other thing is secured doors and windows. So I go out, I do assessments every week. And one of the things I see are propped open doors everywhere I go. That was responsible for the Uvalde shooting. It was responsible for the Parkland shooting. And it's responsible for a lot of shootings that people can just slip in the back door. I did a lighting survey, which I often do at night for hospitals. What do I find at three o'clock in the morning? I find four doors propped open to get the ocean breeze, of course. And these are the cafeteria workers who come in early that day, do the food prep, and it's hot in there and they like the breeze. So they leave the door. They also like to go and have a cigarette, not have to go out and come back in through the main lobby. So it's absolutely critical to secure those back doors. Also alarm the doors too. And of course, the thing that holds it all together is the risk assessment that's required. And the reason it's required is it required specifically by the final rule on emergency preparedness is because everything's changed. Our climate is changing. And that's why we have extreme heat as a threat where we never had it before. That's why we have that flood in uh, Kentucky where they never had a river before and 35 people plus got killed in the, in the flooding. So we also, we talked about the, the general duty clause the new federal standard for security. Uh, we'll talk about what happened in Evaldi. So here's the interim report that they put out. It's from the House, Texas House of Representatives, the investigative committee on Uvalde shooting came out July 17th, 77 pages long. The first 70, what pages one through 70 explain exactly what happened by the minute who was there what they were requested, how nobody did anything. And then the last seven pages, which in this, you can buy this. I have the link here for you. It's this is a link. This is a guy whose daughter got killed. He's holding the report in his hand. And the last seven pages are where it, you need to read. You can see how they got there and how they set the whole thing up for disaster. It was at the end where everything really came together. These are all the controls that we looked at. Uh, the Uvalde response, it can't happen here, attitude, never updated policies and procedures, didn't check into the shooter, even though they had all these complaints about him. Commander on the scene didn't get notified that the 9-11 calls were coming from the classroom. They were inside. The kids were calling the dispatchers and said, my, fr my cousin's dead. Please send a police. The police were six feet away and actually four feet away, right on the other side of the same door. And they wouldn't enter the classroom because he didn't want his officers to get hurt. They also didn't allow the first responders when they were listening to bullet bullets being fired. Uh, he did almost 200 rounds that he didn't allow the first responders to go in and get the kids out and save their lives. They bled out on the floor of the school, just like in Parkland. There was no investigation of the shooter, even though it was public that he was had all these problems and wrote about them all the time. And again, there was no accountability. In fact, they encouraged people to unlock the doors because they didn't have enough keys for the substitute teachers. So they told the substitutes to just leave the door unlocked. Errors on every level. They weren't clear who was on the scene. They didn't know the call, that the calls were coming from. Even the, the guy who was on the scene opened the first door of room uh, 209. He went in, he didn't see anything. And he actually changed the, the name of this from uh, a, an active shooter situation to a barricaded subject situation, which was just crazy because it took, they had uh, 376 officers standing outside the classroom and the kids were getting shot inside. So, uh, and that's of course why they have this a $27 billion lawsuit already in the work. So you can see in another problem in healthcare we're going to talk about is going back to the opiate and all the things that happened. And this was an article I wrote for Healthcare Magazine that's coming out in uh, next month, as a matter of fact. Violence in healthcare settings happens every day on every shift and in all units of the hospital. And the very day of the Alina shooting, which my article writes about, showed 95% of the nurses in a survey that day said they don't feel safe from violence at work. That's why it's getting so much worse. It's also doctors now targeted for violence if they refuse to prescribe pain meds. And we wrote this even before the other one happened and talked about about it, about how this whole thing happened. And the guy was, he overdosed on the pain meds after his operation. And so they wouldn't prescribe anymore. So he started building bombs. He moved into the Motel 6 and he practiced building bombs and buying handguns. Then he took them out on a city bus across town to this clinic and he shot people and put off his explosives. So again, you have to have something that works. And the only thing that actually works to keep weapons out of your system, weapons screening, weapons detection screening, WDS. Over 50% of hospitals right now do no screening. In fact, it, when I first started working with hospitals, I was up in Maryland in Annapolis area. 
in Baltimore, I'd never seen a hospital do screening. And I, when I moved to Florida, they had beautiful uh, Cleveland Clinic over here in Weston, which is very close to me. They had wonderful screening operations. And I was there even on Christmas Day, singing with the local choir there for the hospital. And uh, they had the screening all set up and nobody was coming in without being screened, which is wonderful. And so I think it's really easy to show management what the return on investment on weapons screening is because it's very inexpensive, again, compared to other controls that you can put in place like gunshot detection, which gets you absolutely nothing except you know a gun went off in the parking lot. That's not, it's not letting the gun get in through the back door. It's not letting the gun come in through the front door, through the lobby or anything. It's in with these sky high lawsuits, the amount of money that you have to pay on a on any kind of a loss of a wrongful death lawsuit more than pays for this for the rest of their lives, you know? It also cuts down on the cost of the security officers, whether they're proprietary or contract, because they don't have to stand there every day and do this. They don't need somebody going through a going through the metal detector. You're the person going through the metal detector and whatever you have, you can carry right in through, you can carry your poodle, you can take a, a change of clothes, anything that you want. It's not going to set off a metal detector unless you're carrying a knife, a gun, or a box cut or something like that that has a high metal content in it of a certain kind of ferrous metal. The risk assessment methodology, how we started using it in 1998, and I worked on it for the Defense Department, and how we decided to customize it for high-value critical assets, which is exactly what makes most hospitals. You've got a high-value target, you have the patients, you have the people, same thing in schools, you have the students, and human life, of course, is the highest value. And it's also their assets that are critical to the running of the organization. And every single federal agency now uses this routinely. The only places that don't use this kind of standard methodology are the schools, which still have this done in the state level. Thanks to the, the final rule of emergency preparedness, all the hospitals, every health, every all 17 times of healthcare providers now do this. So what do we do when we want to analyze? Because we want to build a case for management of why we need to have the screening. So it's a cost. How much does it cost to put in place? How much does it cost every month over its life cycle? What's the value of the assets that's protected? So the value of the asset is the people who work there. It's the patients. It's the medical equipment. And it's also the physical facility itself. So, for example, when we did a risk assessment on uh, Oklahoma City and what happened there, what we looked at is the value of the asset was a facility and how much could be damaged or destroyed. We took a, a, a third of the building was damaged and could not be rebuilt. So that was the, the value of the asset. It cost like $18 million for the Oklahoma City building. And a third of that was uh, could would have been protected by the, the control if they had it in place. The next thing we look at, we have to look at, is the likelihood that the threat occurs. Because it's like saying, okay, we're going to put raccoon traps at every back door to make sure raccoons don't get in. And then we go and we look at the research the threat and we find out that there aren't even any raccoons in Southern California or wherever it is. And so we don't want to spend our money. Again, we don't want to spend money on security controls that address a threat that doesn't even happen where you are. That's why you'll see we put these controls together with all these different pieces of different kinds of threat data that we have access to. And that's how we calculate the return on investment. So we want to get the bang for the buck. We want to say for every dollar we spend, we're going to prevent, we're going to save $50 for every dollar we spend on preventing a workplace violence lawsuit, those kind of things. That's how we like to do it and also have it uh, go into a weapons detection system. And now that all this is required, you have to submit these all hazard security risk assessment every year. Used to be you could do the whole campus at the same time. Now it's every facility separately. And same thing, you also have to submit an, an OSHA worksite assessment which is the same thing as a security risk assessment. You have to use the most current data. And if you're working with Joint Commission, it can't be a checklist or spreadsheet. They send out a bulletin to say that specifically. So this is a guide that we go through for these assessments. Then we update the security and incident response and emergency management plans every year. Because again, if we have extreme heat one year, we're going to have it next year. It's not going down in any time soon. So all these new kind of threats have to be factored in, including that uh, FBI Uniform Crime Index. This is how big the loss suits are. So McDonald's was sued for $27 million after two teenagers died in a fight in their parking lot in College Station, Texas. U.S. Security Associates was sued by the families of wrongful death of somebody that they terminated for $64 million. They terminated her 
She went out to her car. She got her Glock. She, the security department saw her coming with a gun and they locked themselves in the cast iron boiler room. The, for that, they had to actually be purchased by another company. They had to pay out a $64 million settlement. It was just uh, three people killed because they fired that woman. Stanford Health uh, got sued in a wrongful death lawsuit, $82 million. After a lady got out of her cardio class, stepped on her the gas instead of the brake, and went right through the double doors across 61 feet into the facility before she ran over the director of Lawrence Livermore Labs, head of the labs in California, Northern California, and they lost the lawsuit. So the families won the $82 million. Elmore Hospital settlement, four nurses received almost $8 million. After they were traumatized and raped by a forensic patient, somebody that had come out of the state prison and ate a, ate a sandal to get out of the prison into the hospital because he knows he was less likely to escape from a maximum security prison than he was from a hospital. And he said, oh, you know, I'm so sick. My stomach hurts so bad. Of course it did. He ate a croc sandal, plastic sandal. And so the guy took, felt sorry for him. The guard took off his handcuffs and he ran out in the hall, grabbed the first nurse by the hair took her to a private room, raped her, and then took three other nurses hostage also. Not only is these things, but it's a reputation loss that can affect your funding, can create millions of dollars in liabilities you've seen. And so just having the risk assessment actually protects you because it, it shows that you had all the controls in place and where OSHA says recognize threats, it shows you've recognized that threat as applying to you. Put in mitigation uh, techniques like screening to be able to mitigate and save the organization, insulate the organization from more sanctions and monetary fines. We're running out of time. That was my timer. So we're going to look at what we do every year. We do the facilities risk or security risk assessment by quantifying how likely the threats are going to occur with real numbers, identify what we're protecting, survey the staff so they understand what their job is in this compliance, evaluate the controls that we have in place by return on investment. And then we we start that we turn in that next year we take that blueprint and we start the whole cycle over so what you're doing is you're building a continual cycle of improvement and i have even people i've done assessments for made recommendations for the last five years and every year they get better every year they have higher compliance they have lower threats that occur they have tighter controls in place and the staff every year gets more knowledgeable about what they need to do on their side so again we get numbers we have industry numbers for every different industry but we also have all the ocean numbers Department of Homeland Security, FEMA, NFPA, which is a National Facilities Facilities Protection Association, state and county governments. We get a lot of our climate information from county government, regional uh, forecasts for, for the kind of uh, things, earthquakes, hurricanes, tornadoes. And then we use, it, again, the FBI uh, Uniform Crime Index, and also the FBI publishes mass casualty data, and so does the Secret Service every single year, so we know exactly what's happened, what states it's happened in, and how likely it is to happen again. And then we look at all these different controls that we can put in threats. In fact, how often it happens, an active shooter. It's this every five years on the Uniform Crime Index for the city that we were doing, the assault, how many assaults they have a year, 12, bullying, all these things that we Act, add these all these different numbers together and then divide by the number of data points. And that's how we get our average. And that we're always looking at what's the next average we're going to look at based on the... So uh, if you're interested in the concealed weapon detection system, the, this is Athena Security's entryway product, their solution. It uh, makes it easy to identify uh, individuals because it has an RFID, RFID tag on it, maintains a hus the highest possible traffic flow. Also, you've got the ability if somebody sets off the alarm because they have a gun in their pant, then uh, it provides ability for you to make press one button and lock the doors or the turn styles or however your configuration is. You can view the monitors and alerts anywhere on your cell phone. And what it does is it creates a safe and secure environment. And so you don't feel like you're entering a jail because the walkthrough uses artificial intelligence for metal detection to overcome this. So it allows over 3,000 people at an hour to go through a facility. While it also provides a higher level of concealed weapon detection, we've actually tested this. It's the only one that really uses the Justice Department requirement 
You don't have to take out your cell phone, your keys, your watch, anything. You don't have to take off your belt. You don't have to take off your shoes. It eliminates the need for that. What they had like the older uh, 30-year-old airport metal detector. And it's a perfect solution to make to detect these and get them out so they never get in your building. So why it's different, it's the only weapons detection system that meets a federal standard from NI, should be J instead of an H, has the highest accuracy of targets, highest through throughput, lowest nu nuisance alarms. These are the false alarms. It has the lowest rate for that. And you can work it uh, networked into your IT system or standalone. And it's got a silent mode available. It doesn't harm humans. And it's not the terrible data uh, technology that other places use. This is the US Department of Justice standard for National Institute of Justice standard 601.02. And this is what it looks like. So you just walk through these two posts here. There's a, a camera that, there's a computer there that collects the data. It can be as small as an iPad. And these columns are the ones that are doing all the work. They can be moved around. This is a 36 to 40 inch opening here. And he can walk through listening to his headphones with everything in his backpack, his computer, laptop, and, his, and cell phone in his hand. And it just walk right through and that's it. So we want to look at all these controls, measure them by how much they're implemented. What, what I've seen, somebody says they have weapons detection. I say, let me see. And we go back in their office. I took a picture last week. It's on my cell phone. I'll add it to the presentation. It actually shows the cell phone, the metal detector, standalone metal detector, the wand, still in the cardboard. It came in sitting up on like the third row of a bookcase covered in other stuff because it's never been used. That is not having metal detection. That is count zero. So we want to make sure that if you get by and pay the money for the controls are used correctly, that the staff are trained on them and that they're properly introduced so people want to use them. And then we can calculate what the recommended controls are by return on investment and prioritize them too. And that's something comes in with the assessment that you have to do anyway. It guarantees compliance and reduces liability to prevent these active shooter incidents before they happen. So you need to go in and talk to management you can, when you get your video, you can sit down and go through it with management, explain to them what you need to secure this facility based on the th actual threat numbers that you've already identified. Remember that lack of security is not considered an effective legal argument after an active shooter event. If they said, we didn't know, we didn't think this would happen, we thought it was such a good community, it would never happen here. That is not an effective legal argument after an active shooter event. So you start by analyzing your current access control for your facilities, adding the concealed weapons screening system that's going to get you to the next level. So uh, get you the best bang for the buck. I'd be happy to talk to you about this and also uh, give you a referral to Athena. And uh, we want to thank you all very much for coming. People that you need to contact, here's my email address, caroline at riskandsecurityllc.com and Michael Green, who's our CEO at athenasecurity.com. And I don't work for this company. I met this company at a show. I, they showed me what they were doing. And I was felt so frustrated that so many people that I work with just don't get it. You know, they're putting in controls that aren't going to help them. They're putting in night, nice to have controls, but they're not looking at the number one thing that's happening this summer, for example, of all these shootings that are happening. Even if you have a good policy and procedure, it gets you nothing when you have a shooter bring a weapon into your facility, whether it's a box cutter, whether it's a wand, whatever it is, you don't want it in your facility. And the only way to do it is to do the, the weapons detection screening. And it's so unintrusive that I think you'd be amazed. And of course, you can call me if you'd like a demo too, and we can put you in touch to uh, get a demo for you. And even we have some pilot projects that we could also get you involved in. And uh, I hope to talk to you again soon. Goodbye and have a great weekend. <music>